Okay, so today we want to start on uh, the physiology of the cerebellum. But before we start, I just want to highlight a few things that you should have done by now on the functional anatomy. First of all, you should understand that it is on top of the hindbrain and most, mostly it gets sensory input. Um, so if you see um, on diagram um, two, let me put the numbers here. If you see on diagram two, you see that mostly what it's getting uh, that, uh, fibers into it. Um, but it is it is envisioned as a motor organ. So though it does other functions, we will learn about it in uh, the context of it being um, a motor organ. Um, innately, it has no programming system, but it uses individual input. Um, and what you see overall is that it adapts it allows for adapting to changes in the environment. And it does so by sensing what is there outside and then changing it to what the body is able to do. For instance, if you want to uh, kick something, first of all, it's going to uh, get proprioceptive uh, sensation of where everything is so that when you do kick something, it, it, it's with the information from the cerebellum, and this will then fine-tune your final motor output. Um, so this change uh, that we're seeing has no uh, a priori assumption, and that change or adaptation will be seen to differ in individuals. Um, Basically, what it does is it learns patterns and ensures that these are carried out uh, to standards. And um, new movements are learned and are stored in motor memory, and, and that is how it, it keeps up with these patterns. We see that in um, individuals who um, are older and uh, they have a cerebellar cerebellum um, this malfunction, we see that the, the, the parts that have already been stored, the motor events that have already been stored are sort of um, enhanced, not enhanced, but they are kept up in this uh, mini brain. But if we see a similar malfunction happening in a two-year-old, find that they're not able to learn these uh, new motor movements because they haven't uh, done them before. So there's a function of it keeping um, the learned motor movements that is also seen. Um, anatomically, we see that the cerebellum is uh, connected to the brainstem uh, by three peduncles. And these peduncles are uh, the middle peduncle, which is um, in green here. And then we have it connecting um, the cerebellum to the pons, and then we have the inferior peduncle, which um, connects uh, it to the medulla, as well as the superior, which then connects it to the um, uh, to the midbrain. Um, most of the input to the cerebellum is through the middle and the inferior peduncles, whilst the output. Um, is noted through the superior one. So if you see um, diagram two, uh, let me just go ahead and the diagram one is literally just showing you where exactly you will find it um, when you look at the brain. Um, but in diagram two, uh, we're literally looking at what is coming in and what's going out. Uh, we'll appreciate this very soon. Um, we also notice that in number four, if you critically look at the lobes, um, we have four, uh, three lobes that are noted, and these are uh, the anterior, the posterior, and the flocular nodula. Okay, so um, the most primitive of this is the flocculus. Okay, so 
we have the flocculus as the most primitive, and it has functions that have to do with head and eye movement. Uh, the anterior is also known as the paleo uh, cerebellum, and this has more to do with muscle tone. Uh, while the new cerebellum is the posterior one, so it's known as the neocerebellum, and this is the one that has to do with coordination of movement. Okay, and of course we have several features that are dividing um, these particular lobes. And when we look at it in this way, we see that the middle component anatomically is known as the vermis. Okay, and surrounding the vermis are the hemispheres. All right, so just surrounding them here. We have the hemispheres, and um, if we can break down the hemispheres, we are looking at the intermediate, okay? So this one is intermediate, the intermediate zone, and this one is the lateral, okay? Uh, same applies to this side. Um, then, of course, we can divide it into the anterior component. Okay, so this is the anterior lobe. Okay, and then we have the posterior, which makes up the most of it, of course. And then we have our flocculus right here. Okay. All right, so there are more things that we can uh, perhaps just highlight and here. The vermis is the midline, okay, and on either side of the vermis are uh, the intermediate zones or the hemispheres. And then on the outer side, we have um, our lateral end. Okay. Having said that, um, we should note that there is no difference in the growth structure between the lateral uh, hemispheres and the intermediate zones, but we'll appreciate the um, function uh, very soon. Um, when it comes to structure and function, we notice that there's a topography uh, that is um, noted. So if I could just clear my uh, screen and just redraw um, this component so we we'll have the vermis right in the middle, okay? And from the vermis uh, we can have the intermediate and from the intermediate we'll have our right our laterals and then our flocculus right there um, so we see that if we are going to look at it functionally uh, the vermis which is in the middle here is in charge of movement in the midline Okay, so movements in the midline um, topographed to the vermis, and we're talking about things such as gait, um, posture, and uh, control of speech as well, speech control. Mm, and we also note that if this place is lesioned, uh, individuals have an inability to walk, uh, stand, or talk, so which makes sense. Paravermis, so the intermediate areas, those are in charge of, okay, these are in charge of reaching, okay, reaching movements. So when you talk about reaching movements, we're specifically talking about arm movements, okay? And then when it comes to the lateral end, 
um, these are large and mostly associated with the, the large base of the cones. So we see that uh, tumors in this area do not result in many apparent setbacks. Um, and this may be due to the fact that this area may be due to emotional processing. Okay? So we won't do much of this because we're doing mortar. But when it comes to mortar movement, it can be the one which we point out as in charge of motor learning, okay? So learning of new motor movements, we, we're going to uh, look at this. Then of course, when it comes to our flocculus, we've already said that this is about eye movement, uh, so we're talking about smooth pursuit, um, head and uh, eye, yeah. So, Another thing that you should know or you should have read already is that it operates on the same side of the body, um, receives contra, uh, from the uh, contra side of the cortex and uh, its lateral side of the spinal cord. So in short, we're saying it sends input to the contra, uh, the contra lateral side of the uh, cere cerebral cortex. So if we have this happening, and it's there, so it's going to send to this area whilst it's going to receive its lateral, okay? So receiving is from here, while sending will actually move contra, uh, contralaterally. Um, having said that, um, we're still going to go back to this diagram and just appreciate some of the functional divisions. And we're going to uh, start with the bigger uh, components, the lateral ones. Uh, and lateral ones are known as the zero uh, cerebral cerebellum. Okay, it's the mouthful, uh, but cerebral cerebellum, cerebellum. All right. So these are the largest divisions, and they're formed by the lateral hemispheres. So we're talking about uh, these areas, okay? Um, and they're involved uh, particularly in planning of movement and, uh, of course, motor learning, which we have already uh, highlighted on uh, the other side. Um, we see that it receives input uh, from the pontine, all right? So we have pontine input. And we have output from here to the thalamus plus the red nucleus. Um, we see that it is also able to regulate and uh, coordinate muscle activation. And most importantly, uh, it's used in visually guided movements as well. Uh, so the cerebral cerebellum will go through cerebral cerebellum, if I can call it CC, it will go through the dentent um, nuclei and then go to the pre-motor uh, cortex. That's the pathway that it, it uses. All right, the next one that I want to talk about is the spinal cerebellum. The spinal cerebellum is uh, this area. So you want to talk about the vermis inclusive of paravermis. This is the spinal cerebellum. So in the spinal cerebellum, you want to associate it immediately with um, medial descending systems and lateral descending systems. But uh, you want to associate it much to motor execution. But specifically, um, we want to say that this is about the vermis as well as the intermediate zones. And it is involved in regulating body movement, all right? So this is the guy, when you talk about error correction, you want to think uh, spinal cerebellum. Uh, because it's about error correction, 
you want to this area needs to know what is going on out there for it to correct uh, any mo any error in movement. So you it's received definitely from the proprioceptive uh, pathway. Um, last but not least, we want to appreciate what's happening in the flocculus. Um, so before I get away from our spinal cerebellum, uh, the pathway of the spinal cerebellum is spinal cerebellum through two particular nuclei, deep nuclei, known as interpose and pastigial nuclei. And these two nuclei then uh, are associated with the motor cortex, and the brain stem and really for motor execution. Uh, when we go to the next one, floculus, this is known as the vestibular cerebellum. So it's the vestibular cerebellum. Um, like I said, that's why I've uh, equated it to the floculus because their functions are very equivalent and it's about controlling balance and ocular reflexes. Mainly when you're fixing on a target, um, it receives input from the vestibular. So input, okay, so input comes in from the vestibular. And then where does it go? Um, it sends output back to the vestibular as well. Okay, so we see that uh, it's uh, from this area to the vestibular nuclei and then um, to the lower motor neurons in the spinal cord as well as the brain stem. So functionally, this is uh, what we appreciate. Um, so before um, I go on to the uh, physiology, I just want to have an inferior view of um, uh, of the cerebellum, and um, what we're going to see really uh, I want us to appreciate the locations of some of these nuclei that I was talking about. So the deep nuclei are within the cerebellum, they're inside the cerebellum, and what we have is the fastigial nucleus, which is the more medial one. So if we just cut through, um, we're going to start medially with the fastigial. All right? So this is the fastigial, uh, spelled fastigial. Um, and then next to it, we have what is known as the interpose nuclei. Now, the interpose nuclei is made up of two nuclei, which are the globals and the emboliforms. So the one that starts next to it is known as um, the globus, and then we have uh, the emboliform. All right, so uh, the emboliform. I don't know why I call it emboliform. It actually has no M there. But we'll, we'll check it out. I think it has an M, emboliform. Okay, and then um, it was seconded by the global. All right, then um, the one that is most lateral is known as the dentin. So this one is one of the largest, and it is uh, the most lateral to this. So the den intent. Intent. All right, so I just wanted us to appreciate that because we're going to be looking at this a lot when looking at secretory. So in the next uh, video, we are now going to look at um, the secretory. So before we do that, we're going to appreciate um, what the principles are. But then we're going to look at the layers, and then after that, the uh, particular secret 
within uh, the cerebellum.